welcome everybody tonight to the sort of it's a preview to the city nature challenge and we're going to be learning about insects photographing them some hints and tips about them and how to learn a bit more about them for using iNaturalist and I'll start out with a traditional treaty land acknowledgement um the afforestation areas are situated in the West Welf Urath Island Glacial Spillway a sacred site in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis and then the city of Saskatoon and area is also situated in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Those who entered into Treaty 6 are the Cree, Nahiawak, Soto, Nakawe, and Nakoda, Yankton, and Yankatone people. May our relationships with the land, standing peoples, forests, and waters teach us to honor and respect the past and invite us to move forward in harmony. May we all come together as friends to find inspiration and guidance from histories, languages, and cultures which broaden our understanding and community collaboration for the present and the future. So we have the City Nature Challenge coming up in just a couple days, and it's a wonderful way to take part outside in nature with the iNaturalist app, and we also can support global conservation efforts. It's easy to use, you just download it, it's free. Uh, go outside, you find something wild in nature, you snap it and you share it, and what will you discover? Um, so now I will introduce you to um, Sydney Worthy. She is the entomologist at the city of Saskatoon, and we are really, really happy to have her with us tonight. Yeah. So I guess, uh, yeah, I'll just get started, I suppose. Um, yeah, so I've been working with the city of Saskatoon for about a year. Um, I did my master's work with pollinators, so that's sort of my wheelhouse. I'm a big fan of bees um, and other uh, important pollinators, so that's sort of um, my wheelhouse. But um, I, you know, decent bit of knowledge with uh, plants and lots of other insect groups. Um, yeah. So, yeah, these are the these are the days that you're going to, have to take pictures, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's the four day bio blitz that we have over like about 550 cities. Uh, worldwide taking part in the City Nature Challenge. This is Saskatoon's first year and Regina had their first year last year and I sort of said a little bit in the introduction about the one, two, three, about how easy it is to use once you have it uploaded to your smartphone and yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, another iNaturalist one. So when you use the iNaturalist app, this is kind of like what your phone is going to look like. So when you're standing at an organism, let's say you see a ladybug on a leaf, because ladybugs don't crawl away very fast usually. So you take a picture of it and then you click that little plus sign and you take another picture of it, maybe from another angle, because um, with ladybugs, you kind of have to count the spots. So the more angles you can take of a ladybug, the better. So you just keep clicking the plus sign until you get tired of clicking, of taking many, many pictures of the ladybug. And then you click on this uh, next uh, screen here, what did you see? And another screen comes up to tell you um, some of the computer vision suggestions. Uh, computer vision compares uh, the photo you just took with a database of photos online, and it makes some suggestions. And if you don't know too much about insects or you don't want to agree, with the suggestion that comes up, that's fine. We've kind of been learning about insects and animals for a long time, and we can use a higher taxon kingdom. So if you think whatever you're taking a picture of looks like the ladybug, a bee, a deer, a rhinoceros, or a kangaroo, then you can do a higher taxon. And we give prizes away for the people that see rhinoceroses and kangaroos in Saskatoon, so because we don't have many. And then also I naturalist is kind of like, um, a nature journal. It will add the date and time you saw the organism um, and it will also record where you saw it but, uh, with the GPS and the default is um, with the GPS location and you can make it obscure but for the City Nature Challenge you shouldn't go all the way to private and if you took a picture of your pet dog or your lettuce in the garden um, that's captive or cultivated and my naturalist is kind of trying to find things that are wild or native to the area and once you're finished with the ladybug you were taking a picture of with androids you save the observation at the top of your smart screen and with iphone uh you share it at the bottom of your 
uh, screen. And then after you finish with that organism, then you can take a few steps and find something else. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, so these are a few common things um, you might see early in the spring. Um, we're seeing a lot of moss flying around, um, little uh, uh, micro moss, we like to call them. Um, honeybees are another uh, early riser, so we do see a lot of those generally. They're some of the first bees we see. Um, again, they're not native, but you know, they're around, people have urban beekeeping in, in the area and a lot of uh, honey production in, in, you know, surrounding areas. So you will see a lot of honeybees. Um, uh, if you are interested in doing any freshwater invertebrate sampling, uh, these are some tools that can help you take some good pictures of those guys. Uh, so there's spot plates. These are really good for larvae. So things like mosquito larvae or uh, you know, dragonfly larva, mayfly larva, things like that. Um, their spot plates are really good for that. Um, sampling nets are, you know, what you use to scoop up. Um, you can also just use a jar. So on the far right here, um, if you have just a, a white tray, white is best if you want to take pictures. Um, and uh, you can just scoop with a jar, pour it out and see what you got. So uh, these are some good tools you can use for that. Um, and as we have listed here, just be careful on water, especially this time of year. Um, it can be quite cold still, and uh, you never know what the water levels are like. So there's still some ice and water around the rivers. So. Uh, here's yeah some pictures of some things you might see um, in the aquatic environments. Uh, the American giant water bug. Uh, these guys are also known as toe biters. Um, they're interesting, very scary looking guys, but uh, you know harmless in the whole scheme of things. Um, this is a mosquito larva. So if you ever see these guys sitting on the surface of the water, that's what they look like. And then we have these scuds. So they're a, an amphipoda and they're, you'll see them around too. They're pretty common. So. so here we have some more pictures of some beautiful insects that we have in these areas. So these are some uh, tips that I have. Um, in, uh, included in this presentation. Um, usually, not always, but usually the uh, dorsal view of the insect is the most important. Um, this is the case for most groups because color and pattern is a lot of the part, like a lot, a big part of the identification uh, to species level. So for example, um, this bee here on the top left, we can see the color pattern on the, um, abdomen, you can see it on the thorax, and we can even see part of the face. And for bumblebees especially, that's very important um, because one species can have 12 to 15 different color variations. So it's uh, important to try and get as much angles as, you know, as Julia was saying earlier, as many angles as you can get. Um, and then, you know, if you can't seem to get it right on its dorsal view, the side is the best next, uh, like, pictures that you can get. Because um, here you can still see um, the abdomen colors. You can't see the thorax as well. So see on the on the left here, um, this species we call it a bikini band. It's got this little um, bikini on its thorax, and you can't really see it on this second picture. And this picture as well, you can't quite see the face, the face color. So this is just an example of um, pretty good, but not as good as the first one. And then lastly, of course, um, is the face. There's still going to be good features there. You can probably tell at least, um, you know, what order of insect it is. If it's a beetle or if it's a true bug or butterfly versus moth, those things can help you out. Um, you might not be able to get to species, but um, anything is, you know, something is, is better than nothing. So these are just some, some pictures I kind of included in from the random internet. So I see these, these bee pictures here quite often where their bums are sticking out of flowers and it's super cute, but you know, we can't often tell what it is. Sometimes, you know, you can reduce it to a few species, but um, yeah, and obviously ventral view is, is the worst generally um, to try and ID something. But like I said, something is always better than nothing because it, we can still tell, you know, this is a fly, 
um, my view's a bit covered. I think this is a fly or a wasp, and then we have some bees here. So you can still tell, um, you know, what order you have. There's also going to be other signs of insect life that are not insects themselves. Um, or you might find, you know, chrysalis, cocoons, things like that. Um, so gulls are often a thing you can find, um, usually done by uh, midges or larvae, something that's just irritating the plant. And usually that's just an aesthetic thing. It doesn't tend to kill the plant or, you know, harm it any way other than how it looks. Uh, so one thing that the city here we are keeping an eye out for, but we do not have yet, is emerald ash borer. And this is a borer of ash trees, so anything um, of the genus Fraxinus uh, in terms of trees. So we do have a lot of native trees here, and we have a lot of urban city trees that are Fraxinus species. And unlike DED um, or cottony ash psyllid that you might have heard about, they don't have any um, additional, you know, fungi to cause the death of the trees. They just, you know, eat away at it and kill them. Um, so we are monitoring for this. Obviously, you know, we're going to give you a heads up if you see something that looks like this. Um, keep, you know, take pictures, you know, put it to iNaturalist because it could help identify um, these guys in the area and we could stop um, the the death of our ash trees in the city. Um, and here they actually make up about 25% of the urban forest and they make up a huge part of the um, the trees in the river valley. So very important to keep an eye out for this guy. And, and what's happening here on the far left, you're seeing a lot of woodpecker activity. It's called blonding. They'll sort of rip away at the bark because they know there's insects back there. And so they're, they're trying to eat those. So this can be a sign of other, you know, damage or woodpeckers eating something else. Um, it's not a, a clear-cut sign, but if you do see something like this, you see a, um, an exit hole that's very D-shaped. That can be an indicator. The far right here you won't see unless you're peeling back bark, and that's pretty difficult to do. But um, yeah, just, just whoops, uh, signs to look out for. Um, yeah, another one is DED, so Dutch elm disease. This is actually, the, the death of the trees is called by, uh, caused by a fungus. Um, and it is spread primarily by the native elm bark beetle, which contrary to its name is not native to this area. Um, and so that's this guy here from the bottom. And what happens is they carry the, the fungus spores on their bodies and they're attracted to trees that are uh, damaged and they're also attracted to mate pheromones. So when a tree is pruned, for example, uh, that tree releases a pheromone that indicates that it's been injured. And so that attracts the beetle to it, and the beetle can then spread the spores once it burrows into the bark. So that's why there's a pruning ban between April and August. And um, that's why we encourage people not to keep firewood because they can also release a volatile. Um, and also mates, like males and females can release pheromones that attract mates to the firewood, and then it can be used as habitat. Um, so, Basically, uh, th these guys are super small and they're really hard to keep an eye out for. We have very specific um, traps that we use to monitor them, um, which you can see on the, on the right here. And um, yeah, so if you, if you see those traps out, that's what we're looking for. Um, yeah, so just another thing to keep an eye out. If you see something that looks like this, you can take a picture for sure. Yeah, don't, don't keep fire with <laughs> Um, so when you're looking at trees, so this is, you know, trees you can take pictures of for iNaturalist too. Um, bottom left here we have a um, healthy American elm tree and they sort of have this umbrella shape. And uh, in the middle here we have the um, elm tree leaves and they have a double serrated edge. So they have one serration and then like a little serration on top of that. And they generally have an asymmetrical leaf base. So one side is um, you know, curved up and the other side comes out. So that's a good indicator. So something we ask people to look for, out for is this flagging um, on the bottom right here. If you do see flagging, it's not 100% sign of DED because there is a lot of drought in the last few years and it can also be caused by construction damage on the roots. So if a street has been recently paved um, or, you know, repaved or some new construction has been done in an area that can damage the tree. But again, something that we're asking, you know, a naturalist users to keep an eye out for. 
um, to help us protect the urban forest. Um, and yes, if you can uh, take any pictures that you're concerned about, you can upload them to the city website and we can look at the pictures, we can come out and inspect the tree, and it just makes the whole process a bit quicker and a bit more um, efficient. So, uh, yeah, so we also have in the city cotton ash psyllid. So you might have heard about this in the last few years as well. Um, it attacks specifically um, black ash trees uh, and kills them, and it's caused by a bacteria. And that's this little guy in the bottom, or sorry, top left. And um, what it does is it causes these curling um, uh, webbing of the leaves of ash trees. So you will see this on green ash trees as well, um, something you can, again, take pictures of and upload it and we can sort of look at that and see if there's been some more um, cottony ash psyllid damage to trees. So. West Nile virus, this is something we also deal with here at the city. Um, we, uh, we monitor for mosquito population numbers um, and we treat for them as well. And we use a, a treatment that's um, actually a bacteria and the bacteria specifically targets the gut lining of biting flies um, in a larval stage. So that's what the city does to monitor for West Nile virus. And if you have pictures of mosquitoes, you can of course upload them. I found a new species last year that was sort of its range had shifted a bit more northward. So it was the first find in Saskatoon. So we're always keeping an eye out for new species, you know, new diseases that could be spread by them. So if you're, if you find larvae, if you find um, adult mosquitoes, even if you squashed it, you know, we could, we could maybe use that. So all things to uh, keep an open mind about. You don't have to take pictures of just the charismatic things. Um, so I guess uh, these are some popularly asked questions that I thought I would address. Um, one of them being what's killing my plant slash tree. And um, I think a, a lot of the concern was over spruce um, or other, other conifer species. And the concern was whether it was fungus, bacteria, drought, or bug. And so, you know, every species can have a different response. Um, even individual plants can have different responses to different things. Um, but in the city here, some of the common issues we have are scale bugs. On the bottom left here, they look like little white dots on the needles of uh, spruce needles. And they don't often kill a tree, but they can um, severely weaken it. So that combined with drought and other factors, it can, it can kill a tree. Um, Cytospora canker, that's a very common one. And what that often looks like is this white residue on the side of a tree. And um, that, that's a tree killer that'll, that'll kill a tree. So again, something else you can look for when you're, when you're out taking pictures is this white residue. And then lastly, another one that's pretty common is this rhizosphere fungus. And it looks like little black dots on the needles of the conifer trees. And that one again um, can be treated and somewhat controlled depending on the tree and the, the state of it. Um, but again, something to keep an eye out for, but a little bit harder to see on that one. But yeah, so these are some things we have going on in the city. Um, there's also spruce budworm. Um, they sort of go in cycles. A lot of the insect issues that we have naturally in these areas have cycles and they are often not detrimental to the native species um, simply because we, we have a handle, uh, a natural handle on them by, you know, birds and, and things that eat them. One exception being mountain pine beetle, that's actually a native species to Western Canada and it's, you know, sort of just spread because of uh, wildfire suppression and, and climate change. So well, there are exceptions, of course, but generally things go in cycles and they're not as detrimental as they seem to be. And a lot of them you can manually remove. You can, you know, pick them off the tree, drop them in a bucket of, you know, soapy water and um, you know, chuck them, chuck them. Then you'll essentially, you know, help control that issue and, and save your trees. Um, especially from an aesthetic purpose. Um, this is one that I get a lot, and these are maple bucks. And you might already be seeing these guys popping up in your backyard or in your basement. And usually the concern is how can I control them? What pesticides can I use? You know, what do I do to keep these guys off of me? And 
no one likes my answer when I say the answer is diversity, because when you have something sort of in this cycle where you have high populations and low populations, um, a, a natural predator or natural predators in these areas and the diversity of those can help control those numbers and keep them more level. So if you want diversity in your yard, have less turf grass and more, you know, flowers, have more, um, you know, diversity of plants and have more, you know, natural grasses growing and, and that'll help bring in some of those natural predators to help control that. But um, yeah, it's not, not really a simple answer, but a lot of these things, you know, we just have to sort of live with. They're not really harmful. They're just sort of, you know, a nuisance. So that's my answer for that. Uh, yeah, so here's a, a picture of a wasp eating a maple bug. So <laughs> some some good, these guys do a lot of good and, and they're hated for, for good reason, but you know, they're really important. So um, yeah, so some more uh, spruce tree issues. Um, uh, so abiotic issues. So uh, when it's drought, it generally can look like the tree is burnt. Um, winter damage is usually uh, on like the tips. Um, and herbicide damage is more spiraled. So this, this top one here, a lot of people unintentionally might spray herbicide on their trees when they're trying to kill dandelions, things like that. Um, and uh, you'll also get these like wilting curling on the end, that's more common for um, uh, conifer trees. Um, so it's, again, it's a little hard, it's a little tricky. Sometimes you'll have to get someone like an arborist to come out and look at your tree, but um, these are some abiotic issues that can cause that. Um, another uh, little guy that you might see out, uh, the yellow-headed spruce sawfly, um, and again, remove, remove by hand. So I don't think these guys are quite an issue here yet. So uh, you might see some predaceous diving beetles or some of these little micro moths, like I was talking about on the on the right here, the many plumed micro moth. Um, yeah, so when you have some of these really small guys, sometimes taking a picture uh, with something for scale, whether that's a coin or the edge of, edge of a pencil, or even your finger or your thumb, something, as long as you're not going to scare it away, um, you can take a picture with that for scale and that might help. Um, another good tip is if you're working or if you're out taking pictures in the cooler parts of the day, a lot of the time uh, insects are more dopey I like to call it because they are cold so it's hard for them to warm up so they don't move very quickly so sometimes it's harder to find things because they don't come out as much but you can find a lot of like really dopey bees in the morning because they'll be sleeping in flowers or something like that and uh, you can get some good pictures that way so that's kind of a tip but you know there's there's ups and downs to every way you go about it uh, another thing you'll probably see are ladybugs um, a lot of people uh, probably know what the, you know, traditional red colored ladybug looks like, but a lot of people don't often know what the larval stages of different insects look like. So um, always take a picture of anything you see and you might be surprised by what you find. So these blue guys here are um, ladybug larvae, so they do turn into these guys eventually. So it might be something, you might take a picture of something that you would be really surprised to find out what it turns out to be once it's all grown up. So, and here's another one. So dragonflies, here's one on the right here. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think you'll be seeing any adult dragonflies when you're out taking pictures, but there's a good, you know, good chance you'll find one of these guys. Um, they're super cool. They uh, are very important. They'll eat the mosquito larva. So yeah, another thing to keep an eye out for. Um, yeah, so, okay, yeah, so here we have uh, just iNaturalist kind of giving you some suggestions. Um, if you are not sure, so for example here, this one's giving a couple species, you know, uh, species identifications with this, the species epithet, but if you're really not sure, if you only know that it's a bee, for example, you can put in a higher taxonomic level and someone else could help ID that. Because if you put it in as, say, uh, Melecta, which we, we know it's not, um, then someone might 
you know, have a harder time finding that and putting it in the correct category. So if you're not sure, it's always better to just go one above. So that's my suggestion for that. Because I see that often in a lot of identification forums, people misidentifying things because they're overconfident. And then it sort of just gets mixed up with the correct IDs and that makes everything a little bit more difficult. So it's okay to not be sure. I'm not sure all the time. So <laughs> I have other expert, uh, expert friends and coworkers that I ask questions and I always, you know, triple check before I confirm something. But... Okay, is that my last slide? Maybe? Oh, no. All right, so this one's, yeah, just showing another example um, for, for ladybugs here. And yeah, most important, have fun discovering nature. Something that I found when I first started, you know, getting into entomology is just how amazing it is to see this world around you that you don't appreciate because it's, you know, below your feet or in the water and um, it's super tiny, and but it's all there. You know, even just, you don't have to go in the water, you can also dig up just a big scoop of soil and you, you'll find some really interesting things in there. So. Yeah, just uh, explore and appreciate the little the little creatures around you. That's, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want me to say any, anything more, Julia, or should I just well, finish this, this is, off? This is just going into the City Nature Challenge that it's going to be happening this coming Friday and over the weekend all the way till Monday. And so we're trying to get as many people participating in the City Nature Challenge. And maybe next year we'll even have more cities around Saskatchewan joining in. And then uh, just like we have sort of an introduction to how to take photos of insects now, if you go out for the City Nature Challenge and you happen to find some insects um, and you've taken the pictures, kind of like how the hints and tips went today, uh, sign in again on May 3rd. And then if you take a picture and you don't know what it is, then we'll be able to meet up and talk about what insects were seen. And then if you happen to find lichen or tree conks out there, there probably won't be mushrooms growing on the ground this early in the year, but we'll for sure see lichen growing on the tree bark and the rocks and um, some shelf fungi or polypores uh, growing on the tree trunks. So that'll be May 3rd and May 5th and going virtually if you want help with identifications. And then we also have, oh, I didn't have the plant one written in here. Uh, there's going to be a plant one. I think it's on May 4th. So if you take a picture of plants, um, Sydney Worthy will be back again and helping out with plants. And that can be found on the website friendsareas.ca or on Eventbrite or on the iNaturalist um, project page for the city of Saskatoon. But yeah, that's all for that. Thank you. Is that the last thing? I've got one more. Um, yeah, so these are, I guess, the goals for the yeah. challenge. That's right. That's what the uh, 560 or so odd cities that are working towards for the City Nature Challenge. Um, so we're trying to find which city can make the most observation, um, which city will find the most species at the end of the day, and who will engage the most people. So you can just go to the uh, City Nature Challenge project page on iNaturalist, and then you'll see how many cities are involved. You can go to the City Nature Challenge Canada page and you'll find out how many Canadian cities are involved. And then you can always check in on Regina or Saskatoon or whatever city you want to check in on. And, and all this data will be easy for you to see, um, whether it's at the international or the city level. So it's really quite exciting to see how the statistics will change throughout the day uh, and throughout the weekend. So, yeah. And it's kind of nice seeing spring wake up in the city. Thank you. And uh, of course, I'm always open to um, if anyone has any questions about you know what we do here at the city or have any questions for me specifically, you can always send me an email. Um, just my name, sydney.worthy at saskatoon.ca and I'll be happy to, to chat. So. Is that the last slide there now? Oh, there was one, one more, I guess. Oh yes, I did. Uh, I did have some some ref or, um, resources here. So nice. So yeah. So here's some good selections for for plants for this area. 
so this area is kind of like in between parkland and prairie so um there's there's this uh resource here from uh, pollinator.org uh aspen parkland ecoregion and fescue grassland um and then the native plants of uh, uh, Saskat Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan. So these are really good resources if you wanted to plant um, some native plants in your in your garden. Um, and so for identification, this is an excellent resource for bumblebees. Um, it takes you a while to get used to them with all those colors that I mentioned, but uh, still really interesting if you wanted to get into that. And this here is some good information on native bees. Um, most people are surprised to find that you know most of them are solitary, not social like honeybees or bumblebees, but this will give you a lot of information about those guys. And of course there's for other groups, there's a ton of other resources you can find online. Oops. <laughs> there's the Canadian Journal of Arthropod Identification. Um, so they have a lot of good uh, select groups that you can look at from different parts of Canada. The discoverlife.org website's really good for a lot of different groups. Um, and there's a lot of really good butterfly resources online as well. Um, beetles are, of course, notoriously difficult because they're just so uh, diverse. But these are some some good starting points. Um, yeah. And yeah, I guess, did we have time for any questions? I wasn't sure about that. This should be the last slide. <laughs> well, I think you're muted still. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Uh, yes, everybody, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question or type it into the chat, uh, yeah, that would be wonderful. So we have someone saying that Lepidoptera and Hemenoptera um, are, are one, it looks like they think that that's wonderful to <laughs> go into those species. And also yes, uh, <laughs> saying thank you. Yeah. I found your um, talk very nice and I like the way that you answered the question about the maple bugs for diversity because there are so many pesticides being used right now that it's nice to find a, a natural way because I heard once that a lot of insects are considered bird food on wings and with our declining songbird populations and declining raptor populations that's a, a nice way to go about it is to plant some more native pollinator species like flowers for the different insects so that's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of birds um, don't really care for maple bugs because they have that bitter, bitter taste to them. Um, I can't remember what the component is, but um, so a lot of insect control, like native insect control, like wasps is, is a better option. Um, I mean, that's just just one species, but um, yeah, so even, you know, but birds can help with so many other things or like ticks and uh, mosquitoes, things like that. So nice. Thanks. And we do have another question in the chat. It's, um, would ventral pictures help for IDing of certain insect genders? Um, <laughs> it really depends. Uh, a lot of dimorphisms are very minute and it doesn't really matter um, whether it's uh, dorsal or ventral. Um, sometimes, yes, for sure, it can, it can help a little bit. Um, so, for example, bees, they have slightly different lengths of antenna and slightly different lengths of their abdomen um, and sometimes have slightly different colors. So, but there's some that are essentially indistinct. You, you wouldn't really be able to tell without, you know, microscope or something like that. So, um, it probably doesn't help that much. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have another um, comment. Um, they have been photographing for iNaturalist for about a year and I've always wondered what was being done with the information. Now I know a little bit. Thanks for this informative presentation. So that's nice. And then to your last comment you made about the gender, uh, they say, okay, got it. So they were happy with the answer. That's cool. <laughs> So I have another question. Um, yep. I heard that if you're having troubles getting a picture of an insect, that capturing it in like a jar or something and then uh, cooling it off a bit 
doesn't harm the bug, but you can it slows them down so you can take a picture. Is that a wise idea to do when you're starting out, or should you just be taking a picture in the field naturally where they are? I would say it's perfectly fine to do that. Yep, um, I do that myself. Um, you can put them in the freezer if you want a quicker effect. Um, you know, probably don't leave them more than a few, well, at this time of year, they have a lot of essentially antifreeze still in their bodies. So I've had, um, you know, bees in the freezer that I've had in my research that were still alive after about two days. So they can actually last quite a long time. Um, and uh, so, yeah, probably at this time of year, you could probably leave them in there for a good 10 minutes and they should be totally fine. Um, again, as long as your freezer is not absurdly cold. And then they like you can let them out and they'll sort of move really slowly sometimes they might have little like condensation droplets on their bodies which could impact the imagery depending on like the you know the circumstances of the humidity in the room and how cold the freezer was but um yeah that's a perfectly fine and safe thing to do as long as you know you don't know, have like allergies to bee stings or something like that maybe then it wouldn't be the, the smartest option but yeah it's perfectly safe it's not you know harming the insect in any way as long as you're capturing them in a way as not to damage their wings or or anything like that so yeah it's 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 humane and you can get some really good pictures that way thank you that's an awesome uh, thing to know about and the other thing is we had earlier in the slideshow pictures of the larvae of the dragonflies and I'm pretty sure that they are in in or near the water. Are damselflies the same hatching in or around the water uh, in their early morphology stages? Yes, they are similar. Um, dragonfly larvae tend to be chunkier. <laughs> they are they're bigger, you know, when they're adults as well. So they're um, yeah, they are similar, but dragonflies are quite um, I'm forgetting the terminology for it, but I just say rounded in the like abdomen area. So they're just like thicker and their mouth parts are, if I recall, quite a bit larger. Um, they're, they're more, they're more effective predators than damselfly larva. So. Interesting. Cool. Thank you. And then we were talking about moths earlier. And generally speaking, there is a moth day later on in the summer. And something that this Texas park ranger does that's popular on iNaturalist. Um, he puts a white sheet out in front of a light and then he, uh, then he can take pictures of the moths that are attracted to the light. Do you think there'd be enough moths out there if someone put a white sheet near their back door light to see how many moths were attracted to the, to the light? Yeah, that's probably a really good option. The only issue with that is it's generally really hard to see at night. Um, so what, is usually done is uh, they use a UV light and they use it, they place it up near the top of the sheet. And that's more attractive to them than say the light of your phone when you go to like take pictures. So they'll still go more towards the UV light than the light that you're shining on them to see them. So um, that's a you know better option if you wanted to try and get some good pictures. Um, but yeah, I have done that and it's a great, it's really interesting. You catch a lot of other things other than moss too. So. That's an excellent tip. Cool. I don't see any more questions or comments in the chat and I don't see anybody else unmuting themselves. So maybe we've come to the end of the question and answer uh, period of the talk. So I'd like to say thank you very much. That was an awesome uh, presentation about insects and, and what you might find this early in the spring. And thanks for your time tonight. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everybody coming. And I hope you get wonderful pictures during the iNaturalist weekend uh, for the City Nature Challenge. And uh, after you get used to iNaturalist and you check back to see what your um, organisms are that you discovered out in the field, um, you can use iNaturalist all year round and keep on going. It's a, a really fascinating thing once you get started and the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So have a wonderful, night tonight and a great weekend for the City Nature Challenge.